Good afternoon and welcome back to Real Estate Live UK. Our weeks of free to attend virtual events run three times a year in February, June and October. The programme is brought to you by White Label, our partners and sponsors, and we'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the organisations that have contributed to the exceptional lineup taking place this week. During the sessions this week, places across the UK will be showcasing investment opportunities and industry-leading experts from the public and private sectors will be discussing new ideas and topical issues relating to property. You can view our full programme of sessions taking place on our website. That link is www.realestatelive.co.uk. Several of our articles and presentations will be linked to our key themes for the week, driving green investment, promoting healthy places, redefining town centres and homegrown tourism and leisure. Right now, we have a session in partnership with Building Garden Communities and Wilmot Dixon to look at creating healthy garden communities for the new different. And just before we start, I'd like to remind you, the audience, to please feel free to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A function. Now, I'm pleased to hand over, pleased to, hand over to our chair for this session, Victoria Hills, Chief Executive of the Town Planning Institute. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you very much, Callum, and thank you for the opportunity to chair this session. What, what, what will be a fascinating discussion, I'm sure. Um, it's going to be big on ambition and big on hot topics. In fact, H is, the, of course, the, the clue here. We're talking homes, we're talking health. I think we've also got Harlow in there as well and a few other H's, no doubt, that will come out during the course of our discussion. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Town Planning Institute and we are, as you can imagine, right in the thick of it when it comes to planning reform. One of the big agenda items is um, zoning or areas and within that, top of the bill, are growth areas. And what did the government mean when they were talking about growth areas? Well, I think they were probably looking at garden communities as being part of that mix. So what great topic for discussion this afternoon, creating healthy garden communities for the new different. And um, this is not just a hot topic now, of course, it's been a hot topic for, for many years. If we look last year, Wellin Garden City celebrated its centenary. Um, so 100 years on, it's taken perhaps a pandemic for us to reimagine the opportunities that can be realised by investing in healthy places, investing in garden communities. So that's enough from me. We've got a stellar panel lined up. It's my job to keep us in order, introduce and then reflect on some of your great questions. So please do get them coming, coming through the Q&A function. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Anastasia Chris Arfi from uh, Wilmot Dixon. And I've got a question really for you, Anastasia, is how important are health hubs um, when designing new communities? Anastasia. Thank you, Victoria. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so, yeah, the importance of health hubs, hubs well, very important. It, it's one of the 10 principles in putting health into place as part of the Healthy New Towns programme. All communities, whether they be new or existing, need access, easy access to community-led health and care services, which need to focus on prevention and helping people stay well and, and healthy rather than focus on in-health and, and treatment of illness. So we, we need to break down barriers. We need to provide more holistic joined up care by co-locating services in the heart of the community. And garden communities are being designed to make sure we have community buildings at the heart, that they create places for people to thrive. We want to promote health and well-being. It's part of the infrastructure when designing new communities. And as well as health, we need to consider all, you know, everything else in terms of education, sports. But community hubs need to be considered at sort of healthcare um, side, need to be considered at the early stage of master plan, ensuring that they're not an add-on, that we create a sense of place, creating a healthy society as well as the other infrastructure. Um, if any of you have read Lord Nigel Crisp's book called Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs, it's about building a healthy and health creating society. And I absolutely believe in that. And all government policy supports it. As we know, the NHS long term plan and um, the white paper issued earlier this year supports the integration of, of health and care in local communities and integrated care systems across England, are focusing on a system wide approach, looking at the demographics of the community. What's the population size? What are the health and care needs? And how can we deliver joined up care, but at the same time allevi alleviate pressure on acute hospitals. And it's recognised that more accessible community healthcare services all in one place, such as a community hub, 
joined up with social care, social prescribing services, and that can be yoga, gardening, cooking, music. There's some lovely examples, and I recently heard of Men's Sheds in Essex, which I, I thought was fantastic. But they help create healthy societies and promote health and well-being, and we can't underestimate the value that they bring. And we need to consider the emerging needs of community, the current and long-term effects of COVID, destigmatizing mental health, for example, creating a facility that mental health users feel comfortable visiting, may want to access um, a health and care hub for digital connectivity for a consultation where they may not have the privacy or connectivity at home. And patients may also access a hub to consult with a specialist that might be hundreds of miles away in an acute hospital setting and get support from staff in the hub. And also a patient um, may visit the hub suffering from anxiety or stress, initially seeking mental health support, but actually the root cause of that could be condition, um, poor living conditions or unemployment. So that's why the importance of accessible joined up care um, it, you know, in the heart of the community is, is, is what we should be doing. And I know there's lots of examples of where that um, is being implemented successfully. We must create the health, healthy societies fit for the current needs and future generations, as I, as I said. So in terms of design, I think it's important to have adaptability um, we need to create some multi-use flexible spaces if we're looking at health and care hub. Um, we, um, in terms of clinical rooms, they can be multifunctional, but also have some bookable space for community services and the social prescribing, yoga, dance that I mentioned earlier. Um, but having having facilities that are adaptable to um, to, to meet the needs of, 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 of health and care and how it evolves as time goes on. And just to finish on some of our recent experience, we were seeing some good examples of combining health with leisure. We constructed two fantastic joint health and leisure centres over 10 years ago, um, but we're seeing a lot more of those now and we're delivering more and, and, and more in the pipeline, which is really encouraging. Um, and in terms of health with residential developments, we've just started on site delivering a community health and care hub in Dunstable which is actually based on our pre-design offering called Cura, um, but it includes later living homes in a scheme which, I suppose on a fairly small scale, seeks to be um, an example of joined up development and aims to create a sense of place, homes and health for all co-located in the heart of the community. So it really helps you know, putting health into place and providing the right usable facilities and infrastructure to support our local communities to be healthy. Thanks, Victoria. Sorry, that, that's great. Thank you very much, Anastasia, for getting us off to a flying start there. Uh, lots of nuggets that we'll come back to in the course of discussion, um, but I did like the strap line, sort of health starts at home, and we'll come back to that in, in the discussion. Um, I'm keen now to bring in a slightly different uh, focus. You mentioned this uh, design. Um, so I'm going to introduce Liz uh, Gibney um, from um, Lee Evans Partnership. Liz, you are an architect master planner. Um, so... From, from your perspective at, at, the, at the ground level, what are the key features in placemaking um, that can be implemented in garden communities to help make them healthy places um, and uh, genuinely healthy places? Liz, over to you. Thanks, Victoria. Um, and it's really interesting, Anastasia, to listen to what you were saying, because as, I, as you were talking, I was kind of applying it to the thoughts that, that we have. And it's really, really interesting to this health beginning at home goes back to the philosophy of garden communities right at the beginning, which is living harmoniously with nature. And it's, it's all part of the same sort of philosophy. And um, the, the thing that I think is, is really interesting is what you say about mental health and the, the link between health, well-being, and the way that you, you um, exist within your community and the resilience of communities that build up. And what I was going to talk about was this... Um, opportunity for thinking about how spaces within garden communities could evolve in over time, um, particularly things like village greens, which now we've realised the importance of um, outside spaces, but also how nodes or smaller spaces within um, residential areas can be used for thing, all the things that you talk about, like, you know, a gardening area, um, a place to produce food, Again, going back to original garden communities principles, um, a place to do yoga outside. You see a lot of people in the park down the road from where I live doing uh, boxing and, you know, uh, shredded classes and things like that. And the thought of thinking about how communities now do interact with each other differently and trying to put in, embed that in a really positive way in the future and linking that to health, particularly 
issues of mental health and support of each other, young people coming together in, in safe ways outdoors, places that can be used for working during the day. Perhaps it's a coffee shop, perhaps you use it for children's parties, but it brings the community together within a very small local area. If you then, I love your idea of integration of facilities and you have health and leisure linked together, because I think that's something which we have realised recently more, that if you can try to combine the two, and so creating really good walkable neighbourhoods that link with the, the green infrastructure of a place, I think is really good. And also, I think thinking how that can not stay just within the garden community, but reach out to existing communities as well. I think there's something that we can we can really learn from that. And realising that we are planning for things that will happen quite far down the line, but what could we do to existing garden communities that are already in the process of being created? How can we take the um, examples that we've learned from what's happening now and apply them based on what you were saying about integration of health? And I think, just finally, I think... Um, the things that we've learned about food distribution, how they could be um, integrated into the infrastructure of garden communities. I think that the importance of people's lifestyles um, and how, you know, the choices that some people are able to make about what they eat and how they engage with, you know, food logistics and others that really don't have that and how that really, really impacts on people's health long term for me that's something that done on a big scale with a big master plan could really change things for the future. Sorry, just struggling a little bit with my mute on mute. So yes, lots of, uh, lo lots of, I guess, holistic thinking there and um, lots thrown into the mix and, and uh, the first mention of, of food so far. So um, we've had leisure, we've had food. We'll come back to these in, in the course of the discussion. Um, I'm now going to move us on to Guy Nicholson who, uh, from Harlow Gilston Garden Community. Um, and for those of you who haven't heard about it, um, well, you're going to hear about it now, but I think I get the impression you're going to hear a lot more about Harlow and Gilston uh, because it is a, an impressive ambition. Um, without saying too much more, Guy, what are Hils Harlow and Gilston? Sorry, I just merged the two then, but just call it Hilston. There you go. That's your new name. <laughs> call it Hilston. I won't charge you for that, uh, but I like it. Um, so what are what are Hilston's plans uh, to encourage healthier living within the garden community as it continues to grow? Thank you, Guy. Over to you. Yeah, no, thanks, Victoria. Um, um, HGGT for short might be a bit easier and less of, less of a mouthful, as they say. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And um, uh, uh, and thanks to Real Estate Live for the invitation to come along and, um, and just participate in this panel. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, just building and fleshing out a little bit of what Victoria was describing. Um, it's uh, the Harlow and Gilson Garden Town is a pretty kind of intense and uh, large scale initiative. Um, it is centred around Harlow Newtown. So we're already talking about uh, some 85,000 uh, citizens who were already call it home. Um, uh, it has an extraordinary architectural and town planning led heritage uh, led by Sir Frederick Gibbard uh, and the Newtown movement. And just over 70 years ago, um, the building of Harlow Newtown took place. But what was very interesting was that um, Gibbard uh, and and I have to say uh, Susan Susan Parham in the chat line is sort of laying out chapter and verse in regards to uh, Ebenezer Howard and the Garden Town movement and quite right too Susan um, um, uh, that uh, uh, Frederick Gibbard actually kind of embraced in a very contemporary way um, relevant to uh, the 40s the 50s and the 60s um, uh, a lot of those values and open space um uh culture the arts uh health and well-being um all of these played a great great part uh, in in uh, the design and the kind of delivery of the then hollow newtown but we're now ready to kind of repurpose that again very much in gibbard's sort of view he was designing spaces that could evolve and adapt over time we're adding to that we're creating uh, four new garden communities within Harlow Newtown. Those four new garden neighborhoods will play host to uh, in the order of 23,000 new homes. 
Uh, it's clearly a longer term project. This won't happen in the next five years nor in the next 10. But uh, already there is a 10,000 home planning application coming from colleagues from Places for People um, uh, in the planning system as we speak. And, and that's working its way through that. Um, but, <clears throat> and that represents the first phase. There is also a significant capital sum that has come from government to act as the catalyst and the forward finance for infrastructure implementation. And that takes us on to travel and mobility, um, but actually travel and mobility that is led by the local. And that means walking and cycling um, uh, before we move on to the future of vehicles and public transport. So all in all, this is a considerable proposition. And um, <clears throat> sitting at the center of all of this is the regeneration of Harlow Newtown itself, of which the garden town is definitely one of the primary catalysts, but it's not the only one. And interestingly, there is a very strong health ingredient coming forward, an investment into a new regional hospital, uh, the relocation of uh, Public Health England, or at least some new divisions of Public Health England as it currently stands. Um, an interesting dynamic when you put it into the context of the local economy and the way in fact that's moving towards med tech and biosciences. A very interesting cluster, an interesting community, but there is coming back also great challenges around health and well-being across the community. And I'm not just referring to COVID in that context. Anastasia was very, very eloquently talking about, actually, there's a wider thing around health and well-being uh, that many communities are challenged with. Um, and, and it's not COVID related directly at all. Um, and it has been there for some time. Um, we have been working very closely. Indeed, I have the book here, Anastasia, Health is Made at Home, Hospitals uh, Are for Repairs. And it was actually, uh, yeah, Lord Andrew Mawson and uh, Lord Nigel Crisp who said he kind of passed that copy on to me. And we've been collaborating very closely. And I think if I may just finish, Victoria, the point and the issue, and I'm sure more depth and more detail will come out in conversation, but the, to me, the primary point, the primary challenge here is viability and capital to realize all of this. I think all too often um, the environment, if I may describe it in that way, and just capture all in under that heading, is seen as a loss leader. It's seen as something that actually doesn't contribute to future value. It doesn't, and I don't mean just social value. I also mean that in a very real cash sense, the economic viability. Uh, and that in turn, as we all know, then enables us to be a little bit more thoughtful about the quality of the design of the built spaces that we bring forward, whether they're built spaces for communities, whether they are for private individuals, or whether indeed they're workplaces, whatever they may be, cultural venues, and the list goes on. But I think that where we're finding a real challenge, and hopefully we can discuss this a little bit further this afternoon, is this business about money and capital and actually trying to convince everybody that a healthy community, a healthy community that is sort of kind of sort of prospering um, is really the ultimate ambition. And that attracts a premium across the board. Thanks a lot, Victoria. Thank, thank you very much. I'd like to jump straight into that right now, but I made a note to myself as to what, where, where we're going to go with that one. Uh, but before we do go with that one, um, of course, we, we now uh, have a, an opportunity to hear from Lucy Wood from Barton Wilmore, um, one of the largest, most respected planning consultancies, I think probably top four in the UK. Um, and, uh, and, and Lucy, we're really interested to hear from uh, you, your perspective, no doubt involved in schemes, master planning, and places around the country, maybe even here. Um, from what you've heard now, what are the what are the ingredients to a successful, healthy place? Thank you, Lucy. Over to you. Thanks, Victoria. Um, well, to, to start, I just wanted to pick up something that Guy said, and I think it's absolutely critical about capital. And I, I start on a message of hope. I mean. With all of the priorities going on right now at a national level, the levelling up agenda with inequality, climate change, biodiversity decline in COVID, all of these ultimately come back to health. And um, for, for those interested, um, there was a key publication a couple of months back, the Dasgupta Review um, from a very eminent uh, academic over at Cambridge University. And some of you might have read the 
Treasury, um, the Treasury's and the government's then response to that review and exactly all about just what Guy said, that we have to realise the intrinsic value of having a healthy natural environment and therefore how that gives us healthy human environments and how they all interact. So in terms of how healthy living can be implemented, I would say it's about looking at holistic solutions so that we're not just looking at almost anyone looking to promote or develop a scheme isn't just seeing a long list of expensive infrastructure interventions that they need to ultimately pay for without a view of value. So until our um, sort of economic system is turned on its head and the way uh, project finance decisions are taken, I would say that taking that broad view of health is a very good way to start and making sure that from the very beginning of that design vision, we're looking at setting health and well-being objectives for that place. Um, I think COVID has shown us that actually well-being is very complex indeed. It's not just about disease and infirmity, although that's a very important part. It's about how we feel in ourselves, how we interact with our neighbours, our place in the community, points that I know Liz made earlier as well. Um, traditionally, the planning stage puts a lot of emphasis on uh, healthcare infrastructure, so demand for GP places, how people would access healthcare. And it is really important, but there's much we can do, again, using um, the point about health at home. Uh, that's through design that facilitates healthy lifestyles, uh, thereby reducing the burden on those healthcare services through prevention. So thinking about win-win solutions through these schemes, you know, we can, we can do things that increase biodiversity and deliver climate change mitigation and adaptation benefits at the same time as our health. So I know some other panellists have already talked about prioritising active travel. That's a really obvious one. Um, but making safe and beautiful places for people to cycle and walk, we get wildlife benefit, carbon sequestration, natural cooling, um, if next to buildings, which all all then just, um, you know, gives us benefits across the board. So when you're looking at bang for your buck, if you like, you're ticking lots of boxes at once and actually thinking about long term solutions that are actually quite simple. You know, they're not necessarily groundbreaking. It's about good design and thinking ahead. We all know that just being in green space promotes well mental well-being. And if you can bump into your neighbour while you're doing that, then there's that social interaction. Again, there's an age dimension. You know, that social interaction is so important, often for the more elderly people or people living alone. And again, this has just been you know amplified really through COVID and how much we valued local green space. Um, so I think just thinking about that social point and planning again, building vibrant communities, things like local food growing, you know, you can get people meeting their neighbours, children can learn new skills, um, more elderly people can get gentle exercise in the fresh air. Um, it's all great for health. And of course, then you've got um, broader environmental benefits. So then again, you just come back to better, better health outcomes. So just going back to the nitty gritty, how can we implement, implement this at the planning stage? So we need to think broadly, as I said, designing in a holistic way so that development is viable and stacks up on your balance sheet. Um, factoring it in at a very early stage to land use budget layout, um, making sure you've got enough flexibility and outline planning applications. Um, I think someone mentioned before, technology is moving at pace, so is policy, so is regulation, and so a lifestyle. So thinking ahead is so important. Again, natural capital, um, net gain, the environment bill, what I've mentioned about the Das Gupta review, this is all signalling that having that healthy natural environment is a healthy human environment. So I think if we think of them in the round rather than in silos, we're going to be in a better place. Um, legal agreements and planning conditions, we need to ensure delivery of this and long term commitment to management with responsibilities to stewardship. I think getting those people who are living there involved in uh, being a steward of the environment they live in is absolutely critical. Um, so just to finish on the three key points, I think we've got to be proactive. We've got to embed objectives for well-being from the very start. Focus on deliverable and holistic interventions. Often they're very simple measures that are the most effective. I try and think of it as what would a person do day in, day out? How do we make it easy for people to leave healthier um, lifestyles? So it almost happens just unconsciously, if you like. Lastly, I think stakeholder buy-in is absolutely critical from the promoter, the council, the local community, the stakeholders, um, so that there's real um, ownership and buy-in and support. And there needs to be a plan that takes you through construction, operation and beyond so that those good intentions don't fade, but become obvious and natural, um, a lifestyle. Um, thanks very much. I'll leave it there.
Well, th thank you all very much for um, g getting us going there. And uh, there's some points coming up in, in the chat, um, one on stewardship, which I'll come to. But before I get to that, in terms of the stakeholder buy-in, I think what, what's um, unique about garden communities, um, certainly the new bits of them, of course, is, is that the, there's nobody there. Now, I, I take the point in Harlow, we've, Hilston, I can't help calling in that now, guys, sorry. In, in Hilston, we've heard... Um, that actually there's an existing community there of 85,000 people already um, and you're you know, going to be adding in 23,000 homes. Just thinking about how do, how, how do you sell that one out to, to the existing community that, that it's going to be a really healthy place by adding all of these extra people in, into the local community and, and how do we how do we tell the story of that? Would anyone like to have a go at that? Possibly Guy first, but um, because presumably there may be some people who say we're, we're big enough already, thank you. We, we don't need any more people here. Um, and uh, how do you turn that conversation around to say, but uh, actually by doing this, we can create a much more healthy, sustainable community? Yeah, no, thank you, Victoria. Um, uh, uh, it, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit rude. Uh, is it okay if I come in first or does someone else want to pitch in <laughs> before me? No, is it okay? Yeah. Please, yeah. Um, uh, the um, uh, local ownership is absolutely crucial because if you want to kind of really um, ensure that everybody can be part of uh, a changing and evolving, in this case, town. Um, and, and, and actually we're moving from a 20th century new town into the concept of a 21st century garden town. And that includes, as you rightly point out, Victoria, an expanding community in all senses of the words, is the, can the economy expand with that? Can the support networks the community networks, can the voluntary sector networks, can every single component part of kind of, you know, the rich, the rich tapestry of life, can it scale with this expansion and do it over time, do it gradually? So are those relationships in place? And that's the challenge uh, uh, on the ground within a community, um, is, is this idea that actually there is enough accountability there is enough of a sense of ownership about what it is that's happening around one. And that's where a healthy town, a healthy life comes into real play, because at that point, people can begin to understand. We can all understand you know, the concept of living healthily, of having better health. The next generation are healthy. They're thriving. They're prospering. They're doing what they want to do. So it's this blend. It's regeneration, actually, Victoria, really, isn't it? It's a catch-all term. And, and that's something very important. And with that kind of the stewardship line does sort of thread through all of this. And certainly within Harlow and Gilson Garden Town, we have a pioneering partnership of five local authorities that's East Hearts District Council, Epping Forest District Council, Harlow District Council, Essex County Council and Hertfordshire County Council. Now that is an extraordinary community mandate that's, that's present with leading on this vision and leading on this initiative. When you have that kind of accountability that kind of democratic mandate in place, you've already started to kind of cement that relationship between community, between leadership and between initiative. And that to me is the real asset and the real strength. So we see this sort of pioneering partnership at the heart of the initiative. And look, you know, to put it bluntly, um, many of those colleagues who are standing as elected members in those councils have just been through local elections. So, you know, fresh in the memory is, you know, um, you're accountable through the ballot box and <laughs> no better way of kind of sort of really testing that sort of success and that ability to connect and engage and build relationships. Uh, an interesting kind of dynamic about stewardship. And I know that's not the traditional interpretation of stewardship, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting and contemporary interpretation of it. And let's not forget, and I'm a great believer in this, is that actually 
you know, there's nothing wrong with collective ownership over anything. Absolutely nothing wrong with it at all, providing that we're very, very clear as to how that ownership actually brings benefit and it brings brings opportunity for everybody who is part of it. And to be quite frank, I still think in the UK, local government really does have that very, very, very strong presence in that space. Thanks, Victoria. I think, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to bring in uh, Liz and or Lucy at this moment and move that on a bit to to ask, you know, is it is it easier to create a healthy community in a new community from your experience? Because, you know, what I'm hearing there from Guy is actually, you know, if, if, the, if the local existing community didn't like the fact that something was coming in very close to them neighbouring, they would have spoken about it in those that local uh, local elections. But actually, um, that, that didn't manifest itself. And perhaps it's easier to, to create a healthy place when you're master planning it from, from scratch, if you see what I mean. Perhaps, Liz, maybe you want to comment first and then Lucy come in. Is it, do we have a better chance at delivering healthy communities and garden communities than we do in existing ones? I think that the thing that's interesting about Harlow and is that you have the opportunity to learn lessons from something that was conceived as a new community to start with. I know there was a small settlement in Harlow to start with, but I think that's an interesting thing to reflect on, actually, in answer to your question, Victoria, because what worked, you know, what, what of the big ideas 40, 50 years ago worked well in Harlow and, um, and, and how can we learn from that? And it's pitching your ambition just right, isn't it? It's trying to make things that are realistic, deliverable and lasting. And um, and I think the answer to the question is, I think, yes, you can make really, really big strides. And the more control you have over things um, in relation to the environment, yes, you can make it very much better. Um, and places like Harlow is existing, you've got huge swathes of green and as, you know, tree planting has evolved over time, that is really good. But um, at the time when original settlements such as that were conceived, it was all about car use and we're trying to move away from that now. So I think it's to do, there's a lot of points, Lucy made loads of really good points about healthy natural environment. And for us, that and cars don't go together. So it's all about creating um, ways that people can move around their communities and which are safe and not reliant on cars but also this issue of community resilience which I think is really important to health um, to do with mental health and I think mental health is something that is so much more in the forefront now and we know so much more about it it's so much more open to discussion and how our environment in which we live and that health begins at home aspect of it I think that for me is the thing that is so possible now that if there was one legacy item, I think that would be something that I would choose to take forward, that we, we can do that, we can make things just better for people to live. That, that segues neatly into to bringing Lucy in next before I come to Anastasia, because, um, you know, if you just take Mental mental Health Awareness Week 2021, it was completely focused on reconnecting with nature. Um, the pandemic almost forced um, people who were too busy to connect with nature to have an opportunity to connect with nature, because if you're only out, out of your house, once an hour, an hour once a day, um, and that's what you're allowed out for, that for exercise, then you wanted to get out somewhere that looked different to where you were sat inside for the rest of the day. So, I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts here in terms of, are we at a real moment in time when we reconnect with nature and and and, uh, and health, healthy places? No, I, th- I think we are. I mean, not just, just moving off sort of just the garden communities point, but I think this last 15 months has actually taught everybody how important well-being is and we need to remember everyone's had a very different experience of, of COVID you know there have been people and you know I, I feel very lucky one whilst you know I like many were juggling two pretty full-on jobs and two young children and homeschooling and all the stuff went with it you know there were others who had no income who were relying on food banks who were cooped in tiny flats with no space to get out they were getting on top of each other and the way you could deal with those mental pressures were to get out you know kick a football around or just get outside and I think um you know as people are talking there's all sorts of conversations all over LinkedIn and the press and everywhere about this new normal for working and hybrid working and I think everyone has realized actually that for them there is certainly people in professional occupations there's a line people are valuing that work-life balance and they're very aware of what they need personally to stay on an even keel 
And that might be time with family. It might be time for exercise. It might be popping in to see an elderly relative. And they're actually saying, guys, I need a more flexible working pattern, whether that's hours or where you're working. So I do think there's been a real fresh look at how just how important well-being is to us however you experience that the pandemic so yeah I, I think the time is right really and it, we're there and as I said it's completely inextricably linked with the climate and biodiversity challenge it feels like it's sort of there and they are you know there for the yeah. taking I think and I think that may link in with something that guy was talking earlier in terms of how you convince the money to make the right investments I want to come back to that but before I do um, I want to turn to Anastasia first because I wanted to ask you all a question. Now we've got some questions coming up in the chat as well, which is great. But um, Anastasia, just thinking very practically, um, you gave a, a fabulous example of, you know, going back a decade um, when you were able to build out a, a leisure centre with a health hub. Um, it sounds, it sounds a, a, an amazing thing, but how did you convince NHS and presumably the local authority or their provider to come together in the first place? To do this because it wasn't even you know everyone works in silos right how, how did you make them make sorry yeah um yeah you're, you're absolutely right and particularly then you know now we have integrated care systems we have it we have a platform for local authorities local government to work with not just nhs but you know other organizations as well but um then it was it was it was less less so and it was more to, you know the partnerships weren't weren't so easily um or made but um the, it was an interesting brief, actually, because we worked with um, what was then Sunderland Primary Care Trust. Um, and they did, when we first started you know, talking to them, they didn't really have a set brief other than we want to reduce obesity. That was their brief. And so we worked with them to um, you know, look at the region holistically. And we actually um, built five healthcare hubs, but two of them were, were joint with leisure. Um, one of them was attaching a healthcare centre um, with some rehabilitative beds um, to an existing leisure centre. Um, and the other one was, was a brand new joint health and leisure centre. And, and where, where we had the opportunity to build the, the whole new building of leisure and health, um, we were able to get some really nice features in where, for example, the, um, the, the healthcare waiting room and reception and, and waiting area overlook the swimming pool. So it really brings in that sort of that active trying to encourage people to, to, um, to carry out sort of those activities. And obviously the easy win is, you know, using the gyms for physio and, and that sort of correlation between services as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. I love the idea of waiting for the doctor's surgery, watching the um, watching the swimming pool. It certainly beats watching the fish, although that was my, my <laughs> yeah. anyway, that, that's great. Um, I've got a question to ask, but I, I want to bring in some of our um, some some of our attendees. So we've got a, um, a, a person who works in disposals and surplus land at NHS. You've got a big job. I imagine there's a lot of change uh, coming through there. If if my local NHS trust uh, is anything to go by, there's a lot of potential. I think is the way an estate agent would describe it. Um, and, and lots of agreement there in terms of, um, you know, what the NHS is doing to promote itself as an anchor institute, as we've just sort of heard. Um, but yes, in how can we fast track this quicker and harder? Yes, because many of us, I'm sure, drive past NHS estate and say, hmm, something could happen there. What, what is what do we think? I, I've got my own views on what I think the how we fast track it. Would anyone like to jump in to answer um Ian's question? You're going to have to put your hand up or just jump in. Well, Anastasia, you're oh, no. Did you want to speak first, Anastasia, because your mic's still off, or is that? Oh no, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, guys, guy, come on, guy. How how are we going to get the NHS? I mean, they they're dealing with a pandemic. We've got you know endless vaccinations. It will never end. How do we convince them that really um, they've got to scale up on this disposal of land? Yeah, no, Ian. I think it's a really good question, and um, uh, I, I, I'm I'm sure we'd all want to place on record, uh, you know, ah. Thanks uh, for all of the work everyone has been up to within the NHS. Um, uh, thank you. Um, but uh, no, absolutely right. Look, I mean, I'm a great one for critical mass, to be quite frank. And I think anyone who's about to invest, you know, 25, 35, 45 million pounds into a brand new regional hospital, uh, the one that I mentioned, uh, it's actually the Princess Alexandra Hospital that's based in Harlow currently, to a new location. Um, uh, which happens to be adjacent to a development platform for one of the new Garden Town neighbourhoods, 
which in turn is actually kind of connected to a piece of transport infrastructure. There, to me, is the critical mass, something really exciting about using the NHS as a catalyst, in this case, a regional hospital campus as a catalyst to create a garden town neighborhood in our case, which is perhaps focused on key health workers, for example. That becomes their living neighborhood. It becomes the place where they work too. I think there are some great challenges, Ian, too. You know, do we continue to look at our regional hospitals as a kind of sort of destination for motor vehicles and only motor vehicles, um, you know, and so we just sort of end up creating land take um, for kind of large amounts of, of car parking space because that's the only way that visitors and patients can actually access the hospital. My response to that is, of course, we're going to need car parks but actually we can do better than that. But I think that it's joint venture time, it's collaboration and it's critical mass. And if we can bring together with, you know, your great capital program around um, hospital development, um, uh, the, the, the concept of kind of mixed use neighborhoods, then I think you're up and running and, and bring added value to the capital program for the very hospital itself at the heart of it all. Um, look, hospitals, as well as being great places of care, uh, and delivering excellent, excellent healthcare um, uh, are also economic catalysts. And, and, and I, I, you know, I don't know about you, Ian, but it's interesting. And I see this from the outside looking in. I'm really not kind of, you know, uh, intimate with the NHS at all. But from the outside looking in, that bit always seems to get missed, is that for some reason we never talk about hospitals as being economic catalysts. And there are these great institutions that are you know requiring supply chains of all manner and all manner of stuff local employment you know injecting liquidity into the local economy fantastic as well as making us all fit and healthy <laughs> thanks think, victoria yeah i think that's a really good point because nobody spends more locally um uh, than, the, than the nhs um their budget will be bigger than education uh, possibly bigger than transport possibly not bigger than social care. I'm not going to claim to be an expert in it, but you make a very important point there. It's a major um, uh, supply chain and everything that goes with it in the, in the local communities as one of the largest employers in the world, of course, as, as we know. If not the second largest employer in the world, possibly the first is the NHS. So there, there's huge potential there. I and Bob, second only, Victoria, to the Chinese civil service. I yes, I, I, that's, <laughs> right. that is exactly right. So, just uh, we need more bobs. That's what we need, Bob. Uh, bobs and bobettes. And uh, we'll, uh, now, just I've got a an, a question. So, a couple of questions to end on. But I just want to bring in um, uh, our, our questions here, just very briefly, if I may, either Liz or Lucy. Now, how do we ensure this isn't just rebranding? You know, this is just um, how, how do we get the authenticity into into healthy gone communities to avoid the naysayers who say, look, you give it a healthy name. We know what it is. You just don't want to dump a load of housing in here. How do we deal with that? Go on, Lucy, you go first. <laughs> um, I, I've been on mute because I've got some children playing outside, it sounds, very healthily having a run around. So um, I was just <laughs> conscious of uh, the noise outside the, uh, the window. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's about it, it, it's all about commitment and delivery. And I think, you know, planning can facilitate that. You know, I think it's about making it very clear what what the application is for, what you are committing to as a promoter and making sure that we set triggers to make it happen and the mechanism for doing that. And I think it's sort of that's the back end, if you like. That's where you come to when you are you know, submitting a planning application and then implementing it. But just being really upfront and, you know, being serious and being genuine at the start as to what your plan is for that development you know I think it's easy to spot a bit of greenwash or whatever we'd say for health you know the, the, whatever that would be but um just being really genuine and say look we are delivering on this and this is what we're going to do and then if it's there in black and white in a legal agreement in, in conditions and through you know agreements for the stakeholders then it's kind of hard to move away from that. Yes. OK, so that authenticity has to be really locked down in, you know, in plan of speech, Section 106s or similar agreements to make sure that it actually happens um, and the promises made are, are kept. Now, the, the last question that we, we have here before we, we wrap up, this relates to finance, actually. So I'm going to merge it in, Phil, if you don't mind, with a bit um, of, of my own sort of question and probably a, a more towards Guy, but but actually all, all of you, really. And, and I think where Guy was getting to in some of his closing comments earlier 
were that you know the investment that goes in um, to a uh, to local communities. Yes, some of it's coming via the NHS, but the investment in a new garden community into health um, will be made by invariably the person or persons who are building that new garden community, or, uh, and therefore that's you know, the consortia, the house builder, the investors. They're investing in a healthy place. The saving accrued, which may not be a saving accrued for many, many years down the line, um, could be realised by other parties. Though now you could say the saving will be made by the um, by, by the person who created the place because the place will be worth more. Well, that's true in a steward a stewardship model that where it doesn't get sold off. Um, but some of those savings, which could relate to adult social care, joblessness, um, poor health, uh, 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 you know, lack, lack of employment, lack of health opportunities that lead to poor health, which means people are inactive, for example, those are set, those costs would be picked up invariably by the local authority, but also central government, um, depending on which bit of the cost they are. Um, so the saving doesn't actually come to the person making the investment up front. Discuss. I think that's the that's the nub of the, the issue. So how can we follow the money in a holistic way that ensures the investments made up front for the greater good of all when it may just be coming from one particular party? Do you want to start us off on that, Guy? Because it's quite a complicated area and I think that's where you were getting to unless I was uh, reading too much into it. Yeah, thanks, Victoria, um, and 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 thanks for kind of sort of setting that out. I mean, look, I mean, to, to begin with, I won't pretend um, to be clever enough to answer the question completely, <laughs> um, and I'll need kind of you know, help from everybody um, uh, on that. But it kind of sort of um, it it feels to me that actually, you know, often we kind of sort of land in this place where we kind of restrict returns. So um, you were quite rightly kind of mentioning, well, it'll be either this party or that party that might receive that benefit. And um, uh, uh, and that tends to suggest that actually any one person is going to see the return, the profit, uh, the surplus, however you wish to describe it. Um, and I think that, that, that actually what's becoming clear is that there's more of a collective involved in this equation because everybody has a stake in it, bottom line. And, you know, so, I mean, within the circumstances of um, Harlow and Gilson Garden Town, you know, already we can sort of see, well, we've got one commercial developer and uh, who also operates as a registered social landlord. We've got HMG, HM government, uh, and uh, at least two if not three different ministries involved in that um, and uh, then we've got a set of local government institutions involved in that and then we've got a load of public sector institutions so for example the national health service now it's absolutely right and appropriate that that joint venture if i can describe it in that way kind of sort of coalesces what we're not very good at is making it into a consortium and actually, I think, you know, one's instincts are to sort of say that this is an extraordinary consortium and it's a consortium that can see a return over 25 to 35 years. It's a bit like saying, well, we're some kind of pension fund and um, uh, that doesn't pay out pensions. It's paying out profit. It's paying out to shareholders. But those shareholders are taking different types of dividend depending on who you are within that consortia. And all of it has been generated in exactly the way I think that you were describing, which is that actually the tangible savings that are created by somebody keeping their health and extending that healthy life by another five years, the tangible savings that then are brought about both at an individual level as a citizen, but also at a kind of um, institutional level. Now, whether that's in the commercial sector, whether it is in the public sector or in the third sector, either way, those savings are quite extraordinary and are incredibly valuable. And actually, if they were calculated back, that is a dividend back to government is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Being it more than justifies and covers, for example, the 170 odd million pounds of you know infrastructure grant that was laid out at the very beginning, for example. 
you know, I, I, I love it. I, I'm, I'm sensing a big financial model here. I'm sending dividends, payouts, long term. It, 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 I probably asked a really big, big question at, at the wrong time because I need to bring it back to a, a, a real practical level now and ask you all the final closing question. Otherwise, I won't be invited back to chair one of these things again if I take it hideously over. So that's the kind of big, you know, how do we all pay for it? Um, and make sure that the benefits accrued come out of it. And as you say, neither you or I probably can. I think you did a pretty good do- job at answering it, actually, uh, Guy. But but I do think we do need a really, really clever e- economist uh, and uh, financial modeler, analyst, and, and perhaps they could come up with something that Treasury might be interested in, uh, some bond or dividend system, as you described. But let's bring it back to very practical, you know, they're, they're, in the example of Hilston, sorry, I, you have to indulge me on this, or other communities that... Um, our panelists are involved in here um you know let's think very practically if we're going to leave our um audience here to think about what's the one thing um that you you know if if it had just one thing you're only able to put one thing into a community to make it healthy what would that one thing be now i'm going to start with anastasia i think i might have a clue what it might be but you you can go first you're only allowed one thing but this thing is going to make the community healthy what is it anastasia um, that's such a difficult question to answer, Victoria, isn't it? Um, so I, I, I'm guessing uh, that my one thing is, ha- is a health and community hub. Uh, so, <laughs> I guess right. <laughs> if I could just say, if I could just say one more thing, um, I, I would say that everything has to be inclusive and, and usable. So we have to think of uh, of not just age, but um, of, of race, gender, equality, to people with disability people with disabilities and even things like um, pedestrianisations and pavements to create active travel need to be usable and people need to be made to feel safe. And uh, and I'll just end there. Lovely. Thank you. Now, I'm not going to lead the witness too much, Liz, but come on, you talked about food. So what one thing are you going to put in your community to make sure people live healthily? Um, I'm going to I'm going to cheat a tiny bit because I think that the the, for me, it's this issue of the identity at the beginning and the ethos, all the things that Guy was talking about and the things that Lucy was talking about as well, that it's buying into aspiration, particularly, the, you know, the point Guy made about a hospital, having a place that has an identity that talks about health, that is what Anastasia said right at the beginning, it's this link between health and leisure. So if I choose one thing, it would be a green infrastructure that enables food distribution and community resilience. But that's linked for me with the great philosophy and ethos that starts the whole process. Perfect. I I love it. It's great. Um, And um, I'm going to move now on to Guy. You're you're allowed one thing to put in Hilston. What's it going to be, Guy? And it can't be the hospital because that's coming anyway. No, no. Yeah, no hospital. No, no, absolutely not. Um, um, actually, everybody, everybody's got a second living room, and the second living room is the flora and fauna of outside. There you go. <laughs> That's I it. love it. Well, I, you may have nick, you, you may have nick Lucy's, uh, you know, crescendo here, Lucy. Oh, no, well, sorry, Lucy. No. <laughs> I, I was going to say. I mean, Guy and Liz's both were about you know green infrastructure sorts. But I would say um, green infrastructure either on the site or if 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 it's not possible it's just not possible to get a decent amount of space because of you know location then easy active access to that space so people can move and be outside to exercise and socialize great yeah absolutely so so important we know that through the pandemic more than ever now just how important that is and many of us will look out windows and see people going out for their daily walk now which is something we may have laughed at um <laughs> previously but actually this is part of the new this is part of the new r- routine bringing us right back in full circle perhaps this is part of the new difference a new different won't be different anymore it will just be something that becomes truly integral to all of our lives as we emerge from this pandemic So um, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion as much as I had. I've had a bit of fun with it. I I hope our panellists have done too. Thank you for your lively comments in the chat and the Q&A. And it's at this moment um, I now need to hand back to Callum to call us to order, Callum. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Victoria. And also thank you to our panel uh, for a great discussion uh, just now. Uh, And also special thanks to both Building Garden Communities and Wilmot Dixon for their hosting in this insightful conversation in partnership with us today. Um, There is still more to come from Real Estate Live UK today. Uh, At 6pm, we will be exploring the G in ESG with Bob Wiley, author of Bandit Capitalism. And then tomorrow, 
Uh, we kick off our last day of our June programme with our homegrown tourism and leisure keynote at 9am as we ask how will the increase in staycations impact places and the property sector. At 10am we go to Waltham Forest for a session hosted in partnership with Invest Waltham Forest and at 11am we will examine the role Agritech will play in creating a more sustainable world. That session is in partnership with Hertfordshire Innovation Quarter. And then lastly, uh, we have our final lunchtime talk of the week with Dr Wei Yang, President of the Royal Town Planning Institute. You can book on to any of these sessions by visiting the programme page on our website. Uh, that link again is www.realestatelive.co.uk. Uh, thank you once again uh, to the audience, uh, to you, Victoria, for chairing, and also to our panel for a really insightful conversation this afternoon. Uh, I hope you have all enjoyed it, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, and goodbye.